Legacy of Satan, a 366 Weird Movies Review, review by Penguin Pete, narration by Giles Edwards, acquiescence by Greg Smalley. Legacy of Satan is a 1974 satanic horror flick written and directed by Gerard Damiano. You might recognize Damiano from his controversial hit Deep Throat, 1972, or his utterly bizarre experiment with puppet porn comedy, Let My Puppets Come, 1976. Damiano had the bad luck to become a political pariah because of all the obscenity trials and bannings around Deep Throat. The psychological scars from that ordeal seemed to color the rest of his work. Especially this one. Legacy of Satan is about a satanic cult, but Damiano was going to make a hardcore porn flick before he changed his mind and decided to make a straight horror flick instead. It just happens to be a straight horror flick that looks and feels like a 70s swinger party in a BDSM dungeon, complete with women chained to wall. It's not as sexy as it sounds. It's less alluring and has more of a watching your mom and dad try swinging to save their marriage vibe. As if we weren't already stuck in the 70s, with houses decorated entirely through shopping at the gift stores in Disneyland's Tomorrowland section, the next most intrusive element in this production is the soundtrack. This movie came along right at peak synthesizer infatuation, when everything sounded like a 20-minute Pink Floyd keyboard solo. You'll boogie to the soundtrack as it plays greatest hits like Flying Saucer DUI, Auto-Tuned Catfight, Seasick R2-D2, and A Swarm of Bees Farting in Unison. So this is Maya and her husband George, having their friend Arthur over for dinner. They're not proposing a threesome because that was the first draft of the script. Instead, it turns out Arthur worships the devil. And unbeknownst to Maya, she's been selected as the next lucky inductee into his cult. The weird part is that they left all the erotic tension in the dialogue, just without the actual consummation. Members of Team Satan, identified by their groovy claw-shaped necklaces, waste no time in stealing Maya's photo to begin their rituals. She is presented to cult leader Dr. Moldavo, who gets in his regimen five minutes evil gloating about what a powerful badass he is. It turns out, those claw necklaces are functional. Their sharp edges come in handy for lots of cutting so members can suck each other's blood. We all sure miss these pre-AIDS times. The cult's plan is to throw a costume party as a ruse, in which they pressure Arthur to invite George and Maya. But even before that... Their rituals start having an effect on her from long distance. Now, make no mistake, this movie is low budget, terribly acted, and as corny as an Iowa State Fair, and Pete would know. But it is a camp masterpiece. This is most evident when Maya's strange behavior comes out in the kitchen. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the scene which is a balance of terrible and sublime hitherto unknown to internet film fans, but destined to take place alongside the room and Troll 2 in your mythology. You love it. You can't live without it. The cherry pie scene. It's insane. What's insane? What I'm thinking. Well, what are you thinking about? Cherry pie. All right. What are you thinking about cherry pie? It looks like blood. Don't you think it looks like blood? No, I think it looks like cherry pie. Now, now doesn't it look like blood? No, it looks like mashed up cherry pie. Now look what you made me do. 
and it ends with Maya topping George, forcing him to drink her blood. So he's her bitch all of a sudden. Oh, did somebody say topping? Dr. Moldavo, cult leader, gets in some pretty dominant scenes over his minions, such as when he scolds the cowering Arthur as, You pitiful worm under my feet. She's not one of us. You pitiful worm under my feet. For not obeying orders. Since this was originally supposed to be a porn, you can guess that this scene originally ended with Arthur getting paddled until his bottom was a cocktail cherry. Arthur even calls him master. But anyway, on with the costume party. Prior to the festivities, Dr. Moldavo's flunky slips George and Maya a wine spiked with a roofie or something. This starts an unbearable scene with Maya dancing around Goofy while the soundtrack plays, oh, I don't know, let's call this one Space Invaders Arcade Machine on Quaaludes. So, Maya, under the spell of the cult, is drawn to the costume party. It is at the opposite end of quality scale from the weird orgy scene in Eyes Wide Shut. It plays more like a furry convention where everybody forgot all but a couple pieces of their costume. They have to do this to indoctrinate Maya into their cult, which they can only do once every 1,000 years. See, that's the trouble with Satan. He has to do everything the hard way. Meanwhile, George, remember George, has been knocked cold despite him drinking from the exact same bottle of wine as Maya. George is being dragged to some holding cell within the compound, which sets us up to expect that he'll escape and rescue Maya. Except, nobody in this movie, least of all George, has been given one minute of characterization, so we have no reason to give a damn about him. But now, Dr. Moldavo has to make a big show of seducing Maya, even though he has all the powers of the black arts at his disposal. It gives him something to do with that cute little blade necklace they all wear. I keep expecting a dwarf Klingon to crash the party and take back his botleth. So now we're having a wedding. But it's a two-for-one event, because they're going to sacrifice Arthur too, for some reason. Honestly, it's impressive that the script didn't just forget about Arthur and George since they each exist as nothing but a walking prop from one plot point each. But suddenly, who's this crashing the party? It's George! Yes, he managed to recover from his roofie, break out of his cell, and find this glowing prop sword, plus find the wedding. We have never seen this sword, nor heard one word of reference to it before this second. All of this happened off-camera, without any explanation how he did it, but by God, He is not going to be cuckolded by this spirit Halloween store convention. Not today. George's glowing sword repels the cult members, and one touch damages the leader, the scar from which is represented by a Denver omelette smushed on his face. But after they escape, Maya betrays George because now she leads the cult and tends to Dr. Moldavo. This makes no sense. But now Maya has to find blood donors to feed Moldavo so he regenerates. It's kind of like the Hellraiser plot, if you don't think about it too hard. It isn't often where you see the damsel in distress do a face heel turnaround after she's rescued and become the main villain. You might be tempted to award a point for originality, but actually, they probably just lost the script and thought they were making a different movie. All you need to know from here is that this movie does definitely end. What have we learned from Legacy of Satan? It is an ugly story, with no reason to exist. Everything from the acting to the makeup is horrible, but just barely competent enough to show that a shoestring budget isn't enough to make a movie terrible. You need incompetence, too. Despite the 70 minutes runtime, seeing it fills you with a desire to destroy the nearest Moog synthesizer with a baseball bat. But, for hilariously campy viewing at your next Halloween party, it fits the bill.